So the last thing we'll talk about this week is how individuals respond to figures of authority. So we just took a look at the ASH experiment and observed how individuals respond to peer pressure in group settings, but how do individuals respond to authority figures, right? Think people like teachers, police officers, even parents, bosses, employers, etc. Individuals who typically would have more power or some sort of influence in us can likely have a significant influence on how we respond or behave in certain situations, right? As social beings, we're socialized from a very young age to be um, respective, respective to our authority figures, right? Uh, you're not supposed to disobey them. We do what we're told when someone in authority position tells us what to do. Well, how can this have meaningful impacts and consequences on society? What happens when authority figures abuse their power or abuse the privileges that they have and use them in ways to coerce individuals to do things that they don't necessarily want to do? Well, this was the focus of Dr. Milgram's experiment. So the Milgram experiment found that people are likely to obey authority figures even if they are being told to do something that they disagree with. The Milgram experiment is similar to the Ash experiment, has been replicated many times, and continues to produce similar findings. So we're going to watch a contemporary replication of the Milgram experiment here, and then we will have a few minutes to kind of discuss the, meet, the significance and the uh, big takeaway message from the Milgram study itself. La mayoría de la gente ahora como no acude a su trabajo, pues no están suciendo zapatos, no están gastando sus suelas. Nosotros acá seguimos para adelante. Have you thought about learning data science? You know, you should take this online data science course on Udemy. It's under the guise of a motivational seminar, part of their growth process. In fact, it was a reenactment of a powerful experiment conducted by Stanley Milgram in 1963 to look at how normal people can commit atrocious acts simply because they're following orders. Milgram's parents were Jewish refugees in World War II, and his pioneering work speaks volumes about the nature of responsibility. It's being filmed with covert cameras. Thank you. Oh, that's Come in. They're introduced to an actor pretending to be another participant. You didn't come from the same room. No. Uh, yeah, we don't know each other. No, no. We don't actually know how punishment affects learning. After a brief introduction, our subjects are tricked into thinking they've chosen their role as teachers in the experiment. And if you could just tell me what your positions are. Learner. Learner and teacher. Learner. <laughs> Our subjects observe the learner being instructed by the scientist, who is just another actor. This electrode is connected to a generator in the second room. Right. We'll go with the teacher. Okay. Just make sure that we have a good contact with the skin, and so it doesn't cause any blistering or burning. Is that comfortable? That's okay. Yeah. yeah we we'll just place these straps around your arms yeah. to avoid avoid any excess movement. Those aren't too tight. No, that's okay. No. The teacher will read out some word patterns to you. Blue. The learner is told he's going to be asked a series of memory questions by the teacher. He will have to remember word pairs and then correctly remember them when offered multiple choices. If the answer is incorrect, you will receive an electric shock. The teacher is then taken next door and shown the generator, which ranges from 15 volts all the way up to a lethal 450 volts. The domestic electricity supply in the UK is, of course, 240 volts. Our teachers are given the list of questions and told to increase the voltage each time the learner gets a question wrong. They are then given an example of a low voltage shock. And try and estimate in volts the amount of shock you feel you're getting. Okay. <laughs> oh, shit. Do you know how much that was? Then? Enough. 75. It was actually 45. Oh, my God. Teacher, begin. Shoe. Horn. Steam. The point of this test is to see whether the teachers, our subjects, will call a stop to the experiment or continue to the point where they are administering seemingly lethal electric shocks to the victim simply because the scientist is telling them to. That's correct. According to plan, our accomplice provided many wrong answers. Each protest was coordinated to a particular shock voltage on the generator, and his responses were played via a CD. That's wrong, 150 volts. 
correct the correct answer is Captain Shu. <coughs> Cup. That's wrong. Two hundred twenty five volts. He's in a lot of pain. Continue, please. But he's he's not he's not comfortable. We must continue to the end of the experiment. Whether the lights or not, he has to go on until he's learnt the words correctly. Okay. Forest. That's wrong. Two hundred and forty volts. Are you sure this is not causing any lasting damage? He sounds in like he's in a lot of pain. Well, the shops might be painful. They're not harmful. What, what does that mean, though? They're not harmful. Sorry, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not getting you. When you say that they 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 might be painful, but not harmful. They cause no long term damage. Okay, so what does that mean? That it doesn't leave any scars. It causes no damage. That seems very. That seems very cold and calculated to me. This doesn't seem like a very. Anyway, <laughs> golden. I got the key to your heart. The NBA playoffs are here. Streaming action live. YouTube TV. That's wrong, mate. Three hundred volts. Staple, the options are diet, jar, balcony, bowl. If the learner doesn't answer in a reasonable time, say four to five seconds, then you have to treat the answer as wrong and follow that procedure. Did you hear that, learner? Just any response, mate. Come on. Well, guess. Please continue. 345 volts if you're still with me. I'm sorry. I can't do this, honestly. Can we stop this experiment? Because I can't do this. this if I, we don't I... continue, we'll have to discontinue the experiment. <clears throat> yeah, okay, fine. That's fine. I'm not going to do this. Incorrect. 405 volts. Um. Sorry, I don't know. Someone want to check on him? It's just he's not making any noise now, and he was before. And well, I'm quite happy to go on, but I'm just a little bit worried about... She would continue. Yeah, I'm just a bit worried, because he was... Like he, he was like complaining before about the. But no harm, no harm will come to him. But he's, he's not making any noise now. It's essential that we continue with the experiment. <laughs> Balcony. Incorrect. Four hundred and fifty volts. We promise he's not. It, it, it won't. Please continue with the procedure. Like, you say it hurts, but it's because it's like <laughs> it says they're dangerous and it will be alright. Yeah. Please continue. Okay, I think just continue the experiment there. All of the subjects were told the true nature of the experiment was to see how they would respond to authority. And that it would eventually form part of this show. Here's a game. 
I can tell you, yeah, he's absolutely fine. You actually weren't administering electric shocks to him at all. And he is, he is, he is, he is. <laughs> In the original Milgram experiment, psychologists were asked to predict how many people would continue to the point that they were administering the highest shock on the board. Their prediction was one-tenth of one percent. They were wrong. The results of our experiment were almost identical to the original. Over 50 percent of participants continued up to 450 volts. The majority of people will administer lethal electric shocks just because a guy in a white coat is telling them to. 450 volts. 450 volts. 450 volts. 450. So after the results of the Milgram ex Wow, oh, so a lot to unpack there from the Milgram study, right? The big takeaway is that we as social beings are socialized to listen to and obey the orders that are given to us from authority figures. Now what's interesting is that in this experiment, of course, we come to find that the authority figure who we think is a scientist isn't even really a scientist. He's just an actor wearing a white lab coat, right? So let's think from a sociological perspective of symbolic interactionism, right? The power that symbols have in our society, right? The symbol of an individual wearing a lab coat and holding a clipboard all of a sudden communicated this entire meaning of authority to this audience of people. So much so that even though this wasn't a real doctor, it was the symbols that he had adorned on him, you know, the lab coat sitting behind the desk, whatever, was enough to convey that message to these people. And it was so strong that over 50% of the participants in the Milgram experiment administer what would, would be a lethal shock to a person. Of course, there isn't really a person on the other side of the screen that's the experimental design, right? But people don't know that. They think they really are asking, being asked to administer shocks to these people. And over 50% will go all the way to the end of the study where that last shock says something like danger. I've seen very, uh, variations of this experiment where that last shock has an XXX next to it or a skull and crossbones. So even with the symbols imply that if the, the participants in this study would administer that shock, it may kill the person on the other side. Over 50% of people do so just because an authority figure is telling them to. What's further interesting is that when Milgram designed the study many years ago, like they said in the video, they were expecting that only one out of a thousand people would go all the way to the end of the experiment and actually administer what would potentially be a life-threatening shock to these people. And they found that over 50% of people would do that, right? So again, take a second to kind of apply this out to a real world scenario, you know, outside of this experimental design or this study, you know, what implications could this have in real world settings? Well, think about that. If you have a group of people and there's a leader of this group, perhaps an authoritarian leader who is, you know, very well spoken, very charismatic, it has the ability to really influence a large number of people, and those people do whatever their leader says, that can have really serious consequences. Again, we can think of instances in our history, things like uh, Hitler with Nazi Germany, right? That power that one individual has over those other individuals to tell them to do what they need to do, in that case, to take the lives of millions of innocent people, has really broad consequences. Cult leaders are another good example of this. Uh, you know, if you're familiar with any cults or like to watch documentaries about those things, most cults start with one really influential individual who gains a lot of trust from people, develops an authority position, and then tells those people what to do. And those people will follow along and do it, even if it doesn't line up with what they as individuals want to do, because as individuals, we are socialized to listen to and respect authority figures in our society, right? So these two experiments have lots of implications about how we as individuals operate in groups and how we respond to leaders or authority figures in those groups. And again, a really interesting discussion point that you can unpack further in your weekly discussions this week on the sociology of groups.